Hello, and welcome back to the Fullerton College Pre-Press class. This is Professor Ben Kewitt, and today we are talking about plate setters. In the past, we discussed specifically how the RIP translates the computer graphics into pixels that are called machine pixels that make up the halftone dots when the plate setter uses those to guide its lasers to expose parts of the plate. We're gonna look a little bit more at the mechanical functions of the plate setters themselves this time. Also, in order to be able to show you some of the content, which doesn't show up in the normal Adobe Reader because it's a slightly older PDF, I had to open it up in a web browser. So the scrolling is gonna be a little bit motiony this time as opposed to just snapping from page to page. I apologize that in advance. And if anybody starts to feel sick from all the motion, place one hand over your mouth and the other one high in the air and press pause. And we'll try to stop the ride as soon as possible. Let's take a look here at what we can do. So, see what I mean? Scrolly this time, I'm so sorry. So we're gonna look at the technical aspects of plate setter designs. We're gonna look at the different laser technologies available and also understand the tools and procedures necessary for quality control. Whoops, sorry, I can't just snap. So. Plate setters is used for things that are known as computer to plate or CTP imaging processes. This allows direct imaging of these plates without the use of an intermediate film. Remember in the old days, you would have to make a film with giant process cameras that would actually take pictures of your layout that you would then take the film negative and use it like you were burning a silk screen and expose the actual plate to this film. Computer to plate means it goes straight from the computer to the plate. This is rather standard nowadays for any sort of offset printing. Although whenever I say something's extinct, that's when you find out it still exists. You have the whole ROUS thing going on. So you have to watch out that there may be some print shops that still use film because maybe they are just holding on and they didn't want to invest in the expensive plate setter. Anyways, plate setters are faster, more accurate, and actually cost less to operate than the process cameras. Once you get over that initial price of having to purchase the plate setter, which is considerable, then you no longer need the chemicals. You no longer need the dark room. That's actually real estate and rent you don't have to pay or stuff you can use for other machinery. You don't need extra people. Sorry, people who are very good at film developing. Uh, you aren't necessary exactly as much anymore. Uh, let that also be an object lesson to learn as many things about as many processes around you as you can, because you never know which one of them is going to suddenly become automated. Be ready, whoops, be ready to jump when the time comes. So there's two main varieties of plate setters. There are internal drum and external drum. Let's take a look at what those actually are in a minute. First, let's talk about lasers. Some of them use thermal lasers. Thermal lasers use basically infrared or heat uh, to expose the plates. Thermal lasers are great because those plates are not light sensitive. If you have a thermal plate, you can carry that around the room. And as long as you don't let it get too hot or sit in direct sunlight for too long, you don't have to worry about accidentally exposing the plate. But the less cost one, the less expensive plate setters, more run of the mill, more common ones use visible or violet light, sometimes slightly ultraviolet. And this is similar to like a DVD player's laser. Uh, it's not that expensive comparatively. And the downside here is that, yeah, it's cheaper, but the plates are now sensitive. And if you open them up for too long or leave them sitting out or don't store them quite right and light contamination gets in, you've ruined some plates. So the thermal lasers are great for that safety, uh, but they cost a lot more. Internal drum. Now the internal and external, in both cases, there's a drum, a rounded piece the plate's gonna attach to when it gets exposed. The internal and external is asking where the plate is. So on an internal drum, the plate is internal or inside the drum. And then it's, been, and it's held in place by vacuum channels. It gets sucked onto it by like, a, uh, it's a round vacuum frame. Now the whole drum spins around a laser in the middle on a stick. And the laser in the middle, and it may not be exactly in the middle, maybe there's a prism in the middle and there's a laser on the side, but the drum rotates around and around and around and around, and the laser points at different parts of the inside to expose it. External drum means the plate goes on the outside of the drum, so it wraps around the outside, like a label on a soup can, as opposed to the inside. This also has clamps and vacuum channels. 
Now on this one, it rotates around and the laser's on the outside of the drum pointing at it while it goes past it. It's possible to have multiple laser beams. Uh, it can be done either using a light valve, which is um, a single laser beam that gets split by mirrors and prisms that results in multiple lasers, or you could simply have multiple laser diodes. And a laser di diode is the actual emitting part of the laser. You can have multiple lasers, or you could take one laser and using different mirrors and prisms, break it down into multiple beams. Whoops. Here's an external plate uh, setter. The man's about to put it in. I can't press play. Unfortunately, the interactive forms of flash-based PDF video is no longer supported. So I can't show you this. I'm very sorry. The cutaway on the right is also useful. You can see what it looks like in there. You can see that blue thing is the plate wrapped around the, the drum. So you feed it in, it goes down, and it wraps in. So external drum typically have more lasers and means it can image faster. Because remember, the laser has to do the entire plate surface at 2,400 dots per linear inch. So you got to make, the more lasers you have, the faster that's going to go. It could take some time to image a whole plate. Yeah, it's one of the big setup time costs is getting the plate actually exposed. Thermal external drums can use an 830 nanometer laser diodes, which are compatible with chemistry free plates. I'm just reading that, sorry. After the plate's been exposed, the plate needs to be processed. It can be done mechanically or by hand. In our classes, we do them by hand with the old wax on wax off method using rags, sponges, and the developing chemicals and gloves. So developer, first you use developer. And that removes the emulsion in the non-image area. So the developer helps you, it's like a soap that removes the parts that you didn't expose. Then you can add a wash, which removes the extra developer and any leftover emulsion you didn't wipe off. Lastly, there's something called finisher, which is not always necessary, but is useful because it helps the parts that like water, like water that much better. It increases the adsorbency and the hydrophilic properties of the non-image area to make sure that the fountain solution is really gonna stick so that the ink really does not. And lastly, there's a drying unit. You can either let them dry in dark drawers like we do in our shop, or there's actually dryers that will dry them off quicker for faster, speedier, more industrial production. It's also possible to do something called a post-bake, which means after you've done the chemical processing, you heat it up with a certain amount of heat and that will help cure the surface to make it a little bit harder. Curing the surface and making it harder makes it last longer for more printing. As you print, normally, the ground up pigments, the actual physical material that makes the color of your ink, will act as a micro sandpaper and slowly rub the image off your plate. By post baking, it lasts much, much longer, up to a million impressions. Otherwise, you're looking at the thousands of impressions before it's gone, which goes by a lot faster than you would think. There are also small desktop plate setters. These are meant for short run things. Uh, they're good for small presses. Um, they're not the most common thing in the world because to be honest, small offset presses, especially the one color ones you'd want to use this on, have largely been replaced by Xerox style digital presses slash copiers. The age of the duplicator is all but ended, uh, but Sometimes they do still exist. It's even possible through some special types of plates to print a plate on a desktop laser printer and the toner acts as the image area because it fuses onto these water absorbent oil resistant papers. And then the waxy toner acts as an oil resistant water repellent section and actually creates a workable plate. Full automation is possible. Some plate setters do all of this from loading to imaging, to processing, to post-baking, and spit out completed finished plates. This is useful for industrial things where it needs to go faster, faster uh, turnaround times, but also very useful for extremely large format. I know in our classrooms, we use typically the more economical compact size offset presses, which are printing sheets and therefore plates of around, you know, 14 by 20 inches. 
which is huge compared to what a digital printer does. But if you go to some of the larger print shops out there, individual printing plates can be five, six, seven feet wide. You have these giant things the size of a piece of plywood you buy at a hardware store. And something that size, it's not so easy to lean over and hand develop with a little wipe on, wipe off with a, with a sponge soaked in chemical. You really need the automation just to be able to handle these things safely. And I mean safely for you and also safely for the plate because uh, they're not only sharp on the edges, which makes them fun to handle, but they're delicate and you can damage them very easily. Quality control. The two main things you need to maintain quality are a plate reading densitometer and a plate control target. The plate control target is like a little series of known halftone densities that get made on the plate. And the plate reading densitometer will measure them and say, are the halftones correct or not? Are the dots getting bigger yet or not? So let's look at the target. The target contains minimum dots, maximum dots, and scales. So you can check the different ways your plate maker is working. You can see if the minimum dots exist or if you want to see where the drop off is, at what point, and this is a real threshold that matters in all types of printing. Um, the, the concept pairs true, but we'll just talk about it for offset. In any sort of system where you're making dots to make an image using halftones, at some point, you have to make the infinite jump between zero and the smallest fraction you can make. At some point, if you're doing a gradient between white and black, it's really easy to start at 100% black, well, do black and white, 100% black, full ink coverage, and slowly shrink the dots and give them more space between them until it goes down to about 10% coverage. And you know, that means mostly paper and some dots. You get below 10% and you start to get into this kind of weird space where you could, at any moment, reach the minimum size dot you can make. And it's like jumping off a visual cliff when you get there. It will actually show up on your on documents and pictures because if people use things like drop shadow effects, somewhere near the edge of that drop shadow, you're gonna reach the point where the dots have to go from the smallest you can make to none at all. And that jump will always look severe. So we were looking for where that is. So you can help figure that out. We're also looking for things like resolution targets to see what kind of resolution you're able to make, how wide the pixels are, and the star target you see on there called star in the middle. That one helps you see if it's smearing in the middle. The plate reading densitometer measures it with a tolerance of plus or minus 1%. So it's a very good way of knowing exactly how dense your dots are on, on your plate letting you know if you've created the plate correctly. This is for calibrating your plate setters and figuring out what they're doing. And also a little bit for fingerprinting your press for use in uh, color management application. But this is mainly making sure that when you tell your computer, I want a 50% gray, the computer tells the RIP 50% gray and the RIP says, great, here's some half tones that cover half the space. And the RIP sends that to the plate maker and the plate maker lasers that onto the plate. And the, den the densitometer reads the plate and says, did that game of telephone, did that 50% go from the original file and it's still 50% when it hits the plate or has something made changes without asking? Processors need to be maintained. Same with all equipment and all machines. They need, some of them require daily maintenance. Some of them you can let go for a week or two. It's important to make the main, maintain them along the manufacturer's recommendations. If they say fix it every day, you better be fixing it every day or you will regret it. And the maintenance has to do with the square footage of how much it covers. And it talks about how much the parts are being moved, how, how often are the servos moving the laser around uh, and you know all that kind of stuff. And that was it. This was a nice short one video. Uh, thank you for listening. Um, sorry again about the visual whiplash and all the motion of scrolling uh, is the only way I could show some of the images on here. Thank you for bearing with me and we'll talk again soon.